Leo Frank legend infects black history. The evidence of any so-called Knights of Mary Fagan can at best be described as tissue thin, leaving no other paper trail than that which leads right back to the Leo Frank defense team. The mysterious group yet found its way into the voluminous literature on the notorious domestic terrorist organization, the Ku Klux Klan. The KKK earned its reputation for violent racial terrorism during the Reconstruction period following the Civil War. The Klan's role was simple, to do all in its power to force the freed slaves back into the critical roles they had held in slavery on the plantations, which were the engines of America's cotton economy. Without the vital labor of the African, forcibly extracted, the entire American economy would have collapsed. America embraced the new race enforcers as true patriots, preservers of a way of life that refused to die. By 1877, the Ku Kluxers had achieved their goal of locking white supremacy in the very foundation of every American institution, and the hoods, robes, and ropes were retired. A growing white nostalgia for the darkest days of slavery and an escalation in militancy among blacks created the climate for the Klan's reemergence in the 1910s. William J. Simmons revived the secret order in a 1915 ceremony atop Stone Mountain in Georgia, and led it to its largest growth in its history, with an increase in membership to an estimated 5 million. Simmons himself reverentially describes the beginnings of his new Ku Klux Klan in his book, The Klan Unmasked. Yet he makes no mention of Leo Frank, Mary Fagan, or her knights. Even so, a cunning new version of the KKK's rebirth began appearing in scholarly literature that brazenly altered Simmons' founding narrative. From Leonard Dinnerstein's book about the Frank case, quote, Had it not been for Leo Frank, Simmons would probably have had to wait before launching his venture. But he found in The Knights of Mary Fagan, already organized but with its sense of purpose vanished, a suitable nucleus for the new clan. In the autumn of 1915, Simmons and 33 of the Knights of Mary Fagan met on a mountaintop just outside Atlanta and brought the clan into being with elaborate ritual. End quote. It should be troubling that the ideological godfathers of American racial terrorism, Thomas Watson and William Simmons, had no apparent knowledge of the Knights of Mary Fagan. Yet, several books and articles rely on Dinnerstein's authority to locate the Phantom Group at the very root of the Ku Klux Klan. This extraordinary reinterpretation, that removes blacks as the prime target of racial terrorism and replaces them with the Jewish people, is no minor feat, and it gives the Ku Klux Klan an entirely new raison d'etre. This is all the more incredible because, beyond the murder of Leo Frank, Jews have no American history of violent aggression against them, nor were they ever targeted by the Ku Klux Klan. Yet, through the, quote, saga of Leo Frank, end quote, Jews have been able to insert themselves into every analysis of America's long history of domestic racial terrorism whilst the 4,000 black, unnamed, and largely forgotten lynching and terror victims are moved to the remote rear. As the veritable pillars of the industrial and agricultural South, Jews were far more often found using their substantial power in support of the Klan's anti-black activities. But Dinnerstein's boorish rebranding and repurposing of the Klan have no basis in the group's fundamental teachings which are actually quite respectful of Jews. In fact, William J. Simmons dedicates an entire chapter of his book to refuting the charge that the new Klan is, quote, anti-Semitic, end quote. And in his entire book, his only references to Jews are overwhelmingly positive. For example, quote, They, end quote, the Orthodox Jews, quote, 
have a right to be proud in view of all their history. The Hebrew literature, the Hebrew religion, the Hebrew commonwealth, and, more than all, the Hebrew jurisprudence, much of which has been adopted by our Western society, entitles the race to hold to its distinctive qualities and characteristics with a pride that all the world respects and admires. End quote. In that same publication, Simmons unreservedly spewed the anti-black racism for which the terrorist group is widely known. It was a bigoted, anti-black philosophy, which the KKK actually shared with Leo Frank and his top supporters, whose loud and continual insistence that, quote, Negro testimony, end quote, convicted Frank of the, quote, Negro crime, end quote, of murder, was a sophisticated leap beyond even Mr. Simmons' white supremacist agenda. Moreover, while Simmons actually capitalized the word Negro in his 1923 book, Frank's most ardent defender, Adolf Ox, the Jewish publisher of the New York Times, utterly refused to capitalize Negro in his paper for seven more years. When the paper finally decided to make the N-word an N-word, the editors arrogantly wrote that it was, quote, in recognition of racial self-respect, end quote. Jewish Hollywood reinvents the Ku Klux Klan. The driving force behind the reconstituted Ku Klux Klan had nothing to do with Leo Frank or his victim, Mary Fagan. More than any single factor, it was the 1915 release of D. W. Griffith's silent movie epic, The Birth of a Nation, and the massive waves of white supremacy generated by the film's bitter racial nostalgia that fueled the rise of the Ku Klux Klan. The movie adaptation of the Reverend Thomas Dixon's book titled The Klansman was America's first movie blockbuster, and it effectively presented the Klan's racial philosophy as righteous, inspirational, and as American as apple pie. Using revolutionary techniques in cinematography, the film captivated the white American imagination and transformed the Klan's trail of hate crimes into a heroic heritage, all sold, in one viewing, to a massive international audience. The Southern Poverty Law Center's 1991 publication, Ku Klux Klan, A History of Racism and Violence, accurately describes the significance of the birth of a nation. Quote, so powerful was the impact of the movie in 1915 that it is often credited with setting the stage for the Klan revival that same year. In fact, the man who actually created the 20th century Klan used the publicity surrounding it to win recruits to his organization. Birth of a Nation is so blatantly racist that it is rarely shown in public theaters today. The racial hatred exhibited in the movie, once acceptable, is now abhorrent to all but the Klan and the most extreme bigots. End quote. No provable link exists between the Leo Frank case and the Ku Klux Klan, but Jews were deeply involved in the original group's founding, growth, and development. Most black Americans would be shocked to learn that it was Jewish investors who financed the production of what the SPLC argues was the most racist movie ever made, a movie that glorifies anti-black violence and deifies the Ku Klux Klan. The Jewish businessmen could not have been deceived by the movie's noted director, D.W. Griffith, because they invested when the working title was The Klansman. Indeed, the Pittsburgh Jewish Criterion extolled the, quote, great, end quote, film in its October 1st, 1915 edition, page 18. And why wouldn't they? Like so many notable Southerners, Thomas Dixon was a violently anti-black racist and an effusively admiring Judeophile. He considered the Jews, quote, the greatest race of people God has ever created, end quote. No parallel existed for the film and the publicity that attended it, until Adolf Hitler's propaganda ministry began in Nazi Germany a generation later. Jewish promoters greatly enhanced the birth of a nation's distribution worldwide, 
and the greatest of the Hollywood movie studios, Metro Goldwyn Mayer, MGM, was started by the famous Jewish mogul Louis B. Mayer, with the profits he earned from distributing the film on the East Coast. The movie opened in Atlanta on December 6, 1915, less than four months after Leo Frank's lynching, to rave reviews and general excitement. And most of that excitement was had by the owners of the Atlanta theater, two Jews, Marcus Claw and Abraham L. Erlanger, who held a virtual monopoly of theaters in the South. They made a record $27,000 on the Atlanta showing of The Birth of a Nation, $650,000 today, the most ever in any Southern theater. It is they, not the Phantom Knights of Mary Fagan, who staged the hate extravaganza requiring a crew of 50 men, including a full symphony orchestra. Thus, 80,000 Georgians saw the most effective Ku Klux Klan recruitment film because Jewish businessmen made it possible. The Jewish theater owners brought the movie back the next year, and at the opening, 1,000 Klan admirers had to be turned away. They even cut the admission price in half so that local Atlanta schoolchildren could attend. And though Claw and Erlanger were based in New York, prominent Jews in Atlanta assisted in the success of the engagement. The Jewish managing editor of the Atlanta Constitution, Jacob Gortatowski, ran many stories trumpeting the film's arrival, including a giant two-page spread with a montage of all the glowing reviews by other newspapers. Accompanying this collection of white newspaper movie reviews were large advertisements by Rich's, Regenstein's, and Myers and Miller stores, all displayed prominently next to a story about the local KKK meeting, on the Constitution's Society page. Roth's Child's Shoes and L.C. Adler's Ties were advertised right below an article titled, quote, Birth of a Nation Thrills Tremendous Atlanta Audience, end quote. The Atlanta Journal advertised the film on the same page that it announced the 18 newly elected officers of the Jewish Progressive Club, just a few months after Leo Frank's lynching. Leo Frank frequented the Jewish-owned Jacob's Pharmacy, where on the day of the murder he claimed he bought his wife a box of candy. Brief 245. In the Atlanta Constitution on November 7, 1915, Joseph Jacobs advertised the novel his pharmacy was selling, The Birth of a Nation, by Thomas Dixon. Ironically, the Jewish-produced film, The Birth of a Nation, provided the motive and the inspiration for the 1915 rebirth of the Ku Klux Klan. Neither Leo Frank nor Mary Fagan had any provable connection or link to the history of that terrorist group. And the phantom group, Knights of Mary Fagan, remains a historical anomaly, having no provable connection to anything except the New York Times. So who lynched Leo Frank? Nearly a century after the crime was committed, we find a few noteworthy attempts to identify the lynchers of Leo Frank. But they all rely exclusively on a mix of rumor, innuendo, and local folklore. Some have even categorized the alleged participants by the various roles they reportedly played in the murder as either, quote, leaders and planners, end quote, quote, field commanders, end quote, or, quote, foot soldiers, end quote. Yet none of those named have in any way admitted their involvement. And of those researchers, none refer to the lynchers as the, quote, Knights of Mary Fagan, end quote. By any objective analysis, the Knights of Mary Fagan is as fraudulent a concoction and as fantastically false as the claim that Frank's 1913 trial was, quote, mob-dominated, end quote, and filled with cries of, quote, kill the Jew, end quote. Neither existed in its time, yet both assertions, though baseless, are now securely ensconced in the Leo Frank legend. And both fabrications have elevated the Leo Frank affair to central places in the narratives of black history. But this still leaves scholars with a critical but unanswered question. Who really killed Leo Frank? 
How was the New York Times able to invent a group and announce its role as Frank's executioner a full two months before the actual lynching? Did the New York Times, which was described by Steve Oney as a full-fledged member of the Leo Frank defense team, know more about the planned murder of Leo Frank than is generally believed or recognized? As with any conspiracy investigation, one must first ask, who benefited? And here is where those who have pressed a myriad of Leo Frank mythologies into the American consciousness get a rude awakening. In 1915, two years after his conviction for murder, Leo Frank was an entirely different person in the public's perception from the man he was in reality. The master propagandist at the helm of his massive international public relations campaign, the Chicago-based advertising magnate Albert Lasker, and the New York Times publisher Adolf Ox, had transformed Frank from an unappealing, child-exploiting sexual strangler into a persecuted messianic figure, the innocent victim of an anti-Semitic juggernaut, stoically preparing to die for the sins of the South. Through the duo's adroit manipulation of the world's willing press, this superhuman image of Leo Frank as a persecuted Jew was easily perpetuated. As long as he was locked away in Milledgeville Penitentiary and inaccessible to those who had earnestly adopted his cause. But if Frank were released or given free access to the press and the public, there was serious and justifiable doubt about whether he would ever be able to live up to that concocted public image. And that vexed his Jewish supporters. Many, if not most, had joined the cause to fight for the good name of Judaism and of B'nai B'rith through their symbolic stand with Leo Frank, a man whose private life represented neither very well. The battle had also rallied the Jews of America to a once-elusive cultural oneness. But the movement Frank had birthed had achieved a symbolic status that conflicted with Frank's flawed character and abrasive personality. We must remember that Albert Lasker, upon meeting Frank for the first time, had a viscerally negative reaction to him. Quote, it was very hard for us to be fair to him. He, end quote, Frank, quote, impressed us as a sexual pervert. Now, he may not have been, or rather a homosexual or something like that, end quote. According to Lasker's biographer, the men with him during that encounter took, quote, a violent dislike to him, end quote, Frank. Lasker, quote, hated him, end quote, and said, quote, I hope he, end quote, Frank, quote, gets out. And when he gets out, I hope he slips on a banana peel and breaks his neck, end quote. Another high-profile Jewish supporter, Sears magnate Julius Rosenwald, selflessly gave $10,000 to Frank's defense, but was agitated at Frank's impersonal thank you note and made it known to others in private correspondence. The Jews orchestrating Frank's PR campaign clearly saw the bigger problem they had created in their single-minded pursuit of Frank's vindication. To turn such a man over to public inspection, even if his supporters believed him to be innocent, was fraught with danger and lethal to their cause. And if Frank's defenders had accepted that he was indeed the murderer, they certainly could see no value in a living witness to the realities of what had occurred on April 26, 1913, the day of Mary Fagan's demise. As a group, Jewish leaders had made the calculated decision to hold their noses at the particulars of the murder and fight to clear the name of Jews by incidentally clearing Leo Frank of the crime. Their success at achieving the commutation, however, proved to be a double-edged sword. The artificial image of victimization that Lasker had created would very likely collapse if Leo Frank was released, and his release from his term of life imprisonment was imminent. The prisoner himself was under the clear impression that as soon as the post-commutation hysteria died down, he would be quietly returned to New York as a free man. B'nai B'rith attorneys Dale M. Schwartz and Charles F. Wittenstein 
handled the attempts in the 1980s to have Frank pardoned by the state of Georgia. Schwartz revealed in an interview that the game plan, so to speak, was to commute Frank's sentence to life imprisonment. And when the heat was off and people cooled down in a few months, they were probably going to pardon him and let him out of jail altogether. No one probably feared this more than Frank's closest friends and supporters. In fact, as the public's interest grew, requests flooded in for interviews with Frank. But his attorney, Herbert Haas, was described by Steve Oney as, quote, dead set against further public comment, fearing that more attention would only increase animosities, end quote. The fact is that both the friends and the enemies of Leo Frank would gain from his elimination. Georgians that had followed the trial were as unanimous as the jury in their belief in Frank's guilt for both murder and the far uglier unofficial charges of, quote, perversion, end quote, rape and pedophilia. The few of Georgia's politicians and elites that had aligned with Governor Slayton in commuting Frank's death sentence publicly spouted the proper political platitudes. But after they watched their governor and his family be forced into out-of-state exile, whilst the prisoner enjoyed a leisure life of country air and Alberta peaches, Georgia's high and mighty really saw no value in a living Leo, who would continue to create deep political division as long as he remained at Milledgeville Prison. Similarly, incoming Governor Nathaniel E. Harris rushed to the side of Leo M. Frank when the prisoner's throat was cut by a fellow inmate, and he recalled, quote, While the doctor was washing the wound, Frank coughed, and I asked the doctor immediately, with a good deal of sympathy in my voice, Won't that wound attack his lungs before it heals? When I asked this, Frank laughed a queer sort of laugh, a laugh that showed, at least to me, a hard, careless heart. And the doubt, which I had about his guilt, was lessened greatly as I heard the laugh and looked into his face. I could not help the impression. Looking back on it now, I do not see why I should have been impressed, but I felt then that the man was undoubtedly a hardened criminal or a reckless prisoner. End quote. Frank's image was far more attractive in the hands of experts like master marketer Albert Lasker than in Frank's own hands. Ox's assessment of Frank's personality mirrored that of Lasker and Harris. Assistant editor at the Times, Garrett Garrett, kept a diary in which he revealed, quote, I'm sure at last it was a relief to, end quote, Mr. Ox, quote, to have, end quote, Frank, quote, lynched and out of the way. I have felt for some time that he secretly despised Frank, end quote. Clearly, if Frank were actually released into the sympathetic arms of the public, his own repellent personality would reveal the very opposite of Jewish victimhood. The presumption of innocence would have vanished, and the massive campaign to free him would be exposed for what it actually was, namely a flexing of Jewish power and a demonstration of might that would have reinforced every stereotype of the powerful Jewish banker and the debauched Jewish corrupter. Certainly, Tom Watson would have had a field day with that argument. And if Frank, the, quote, careless, end quote, quote, queer, end quote, quote, despised, end quote, and, quote, hated, end quote, quote, sexual pervert, end quote, were released from prison with Mary Fagan's murder unavenged, the Jews of the South, for the first time, might have found themselves in actual physical danger. Frank's teetering on the brink of death served only to inflame his ego, whereby he had actually come to believe his own press. Oni had to admit that, quote, the sight of his name in print mesmerized him, end quote. And he also quoted Ox, quote, Frank would feel cheated if he did not have a chance to make a speech from the scaffold, end quote. And as shown in his ultra-rehearsed but disastrous trial statement, his own open mouth made him his own open enemy. Frank's own lawyers admonished him about it. 
Herbert Haas wrote to him, quote, Let me caution you against giving out interviews. A friend of ours advised us today that interviews from you were appearing in northern and eastern papers. I think you should not do this. End quote. Be with us again next time when we present the next chapter of The Secret Relationship Between Blacks and Jews, Volume 3. The Leo Frank Case, The Lynching of a Guilty Man. Prepared by the Historical Research Department of the Nation of Islam, Chicago, Illinois. Copyright 2016 by Latimer Associates. All rights reserved. Published in audiobook form by the American Mercury with permission of the Historical Research Department of the Nation of Islam. Of the Nation of Islam. Of the Nation of Islam.